Solutions are scant to tame inflation. And now, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers says millions of Americans will have to lose their jobs for prices to come back to earth. Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman here with more on this. Rick, good to see you. He said at this speech in London, um, ought to make him pretty popular at cocktail parties. Hey, I want 10 million people to lose their jobs. Uh, but is he right? Larry Summers does not really care about offending people. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, who knows? I mean, he put this out there. So I, I, I think what he did, that's, what he added that's new to the conversation is he sort of created a rule of thumb for how much the Federal Reserve would have to actually slow the economy in order to get inflation uh, under control. And I don't think he defined under control, but maybe he was saying back to around their 2% target. So right now it's about 8.6%. And he said the uh, unemployment rate would have to rise to the equivalent of 5% for five years. And that could happen in different ways. It could be 7.5% for two years or 10% for one year or something like that. Uh, but, but that's how much uh, unemployment uh, and, uh, and economic pain, he says, it would take to actually get inflation where the Fed needs to get it. I did some more informal math on that. And uh, if the unemployment rate, which is now 3.6%, if that went up to about 5%, that, that would be the loss of about 2.2 million jobs. And uh, Larry Summers said we'd have to go through that for uh, five years to get to the inflation target. So that would be some pain for, clearly be some pain for some uh, portion of Americans and definitely not the soft landing that Wall Street hopes the Fed is able to engineer here. Now, I'm sure we're gonna he hear some other economists saying, ah, he's overstating it. Uh, the Federal Reserve itself will probably push back on that. Um, but that's one man's view. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Thanks for being here for this evening's program, which I'm calling The People versus Larry Summers. Um, of course, we've subtitled it, They're Wrong, Stop Larry Summers and Fed Chair Jerome Powell from Shutting Down the Economy. And what we hope to do this evening is explore this idea that the, that the only way or the proper way to tame inflation is through economic hardship and millions of people losing their jobs. So um, my name is Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator this evening. I'm a small business person from the Pacific Northwest and a member of the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. And so I'm happy to welcome our esteemed speakers this evening, and we are going to go right to them. And we're going to start with Alfeka Mutardi, who is a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and is now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeka? Great. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome to all of you this evening to talk, talk about this very important topic. So what I'd like to do to start us off is just to see where we are uh, and talk a little bit about the National Infrastructure Bank and its plan to have a better policy to move forward uh, in fighting in inflation. So um, to do that, I'm going to um, oops, um, I'm going to uh, start with um, uh, our bill in Congress, which is HR 3339. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, it would create a five trillion dollar public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. We currently have uh, 14 co-sponsors on this bill and we, all of our coalition all across the country is actively working with their state legislators to talk to their members of Congress to see if we can bring on more members to co-sponsor this bill as an alternative policy for uh, the short term uh, fighting inflation and pushing against a recession, and in the long term, building out all of our infrastructure. So let's get started, um, talk about the economy first. Uh, the first, the big news is that inflation has cooled down just a little bit from 9.1% last month to 8.5% in July. And uh, the that was pulled down by gasoline prices moderating from their, their high of $5 down to $3.99 a gallon currently. Uh, however, rent prices are still way up. Ask, uh, asking prices for rents are way up. That'll uh, move into the CPI numbers uh, gradually over time. And inflation is make, really making a hardship for the working poor, causing them to suffer from higher food prices and food insecurity and housing insecurity as well. So um, the, this inflation problem is really hitting the economy and the poorest uh, members of our economy are suffering the, the, the consequences the most. The Fed action so far to fight 
this inflation is that they've been re raising the rate at which the Fed lends to banks um, by about uh, three quarters of, of a percent uh, of each month over the last two months. Uh, they also began their program of tightening the money supply. This is called quantitative tightening, uh, which also makes money dearer and uh, then the, right, that raises interest rates. Um, but uh, we have uh, lower uh, consumer demand uh, is intensifying the recession. So interest rates are up as a result of this. The 10-year rate uh, treasury rate is now up to 2.85%. Uh, 30-year mortgages are up around 6%. The national debt, of course, is huge. It's a 36 tr $30, 30 trillion dollars. Uh, and we have something called the yield curve, which is inverted, which points to a recession. That means that longer term interest rates are even lower than shorter term interest rates, which is sort of counterintuitive. So we're technically in a recession. We've had uh, the first two quarters of uh, 2022 have seen negative growth. There's still strong consumer demand, although the factory boom and manufacturing is waning off a little bit as our housing starts. The, hot, the labor market is still very hot. In July, we added 528,000 jobs, which was higher than uh, the pundits expected. The unemployment rate is down to uh, a pretty low, cool low of 3.5%. But counterintuitively, we have a lot of job openings, two for er two job openings for every um, person that's unemployed. But um, we have a lot of people that are out of the labor force still. Uh, we uh, have people that are working two full-time jobs instead of just one, just to get by. And our labor productivity, that is the usefulness with which we use labor, has declined in the first quarter of 2022 uh, as labor cost of jump. So we're not we're misallocating how we're using labor, um, and that is pushing against uh, even growth. And growth is uh, is slowing down also on account of climate change, weather events that are uh, taking lives and destroying uh, private uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have to um, do something with the climate change effect on our economy, or uh, we'll go into negative growth even just from that. And our and our banks banking system is in a shaky state. Uh, they're sitting on lots of uh, bad debt, derivatives, cryptocurrency, corporate debt, and even the largest bank in the country failed its stress test. And now it has to, uh, because it's going to face a $44 billion loss because of its um, bets in the stock market and so forth. And so it has to uh, recapitalize uh, itself. So that's where the economy is. Uh, now, what's wrong with Larry Summers' uh, um, um, prescription for our economy? Well, let's just start and take a look at typically what the, uh, the government response is to inflation. Normally, the government, what has done is clamps down on the money supply, uh, and that creates a recession, and that results in people losing their jobs. And then because recessions are politically unpopular, uh, the government goes into budget deficit spending to bring the jobs back, and that ratchets up the federal debt. So this is what our consumer price index has looked like over time since 1970. Uh, you can see that it uh, it was uh, sort of on this trajectory, and then it bounced way up right here in the 1970s as Richard Nixon was trying to do the poverty program and spend more in the Viet uh, spend money in the Vietnam War at the, at the same time. Uh, Paul Volcker stepped in and really clamped down on the money supply, and that caused quite a string of recessions, which brought things under control. But then fundamentally, our, our financial system changed. And in this trajectory right here, uh, we've, we've not had much uh, CPI inflation because all of the money that was being produced by the Federal Reserve was going into asset price inflation. That is higher housing, higher stock markets, and those kind of things. It didn't hit the CPI numbers. So the last few recessions that we've had uh, over this period, this was the um, the dot com bubble uh, bursting right here, uh, which was a financial um, event. This was the 2008 uh, recession caused by the the meltdown of the whole financial system, and then this was, of course, the, the short lived COVID recession right here. On all three of these uh, events, even though they weren't caused by CPI inflation, we we did have a lot of government spending, deficit spending that ratcheted up the federal debt. So Larry Summers, what he's spec what he speculated that we need to do is have 
uh, that that uh, excessive um, stimulus uh, spending and runaway wage growth, which is not true, wages in real terms have gone down, has caused the inflation. That's wrong. Uh, and he says we need this five years of six uh, percent unemployment or one year of ten percent unemployment in order to break this inflation br um, back. That'll really put millions of people out of work. Uh, one uh, uh, pundit speculated on his analysis that he may have uh, a conflict of interest because, because some of his companies are, could even benefit by such a recession. But a lot of people have shot back against this policy. Elizabeth <laughs> Warren came out with an op-ed. She said that um, it was the Fed that caused the inflation by printing too much money. And the policy is misguided if it puts people out of work. And uh, she, uh, Powell admitted before her committee that uh, interest rates won't be lowered, uh, uh, won't lower um, as a result of gas prices or food prices coming down. Congress, rather, she thinks Congress should fight inflation by investing in affordable childcare, ending tax breaks for offshoring, and investing in American manufacturing. And then the American Prospect has had a whole series of articles talking about concentration of companies, that is, a few companies owning large swaths of things, including our railroads, our ports, um, and our production, productive companies. They're doing price gouging. Um, they've admitted that in their earnings re reports to their stockholders, and they reduce their investments in the companies that they own so that they're ill-equipped to face something like the COVID downturn which re resulted in supply chain problems. So um, th these are things that we need to work on. Uh, what happens on the federal budget side when we have a recession? As I said, typically, uh, the typical fiscal response is to do deficit spending to bring jobs back. And that is usually consumption spending, not investment spending. Um, macroeconomists typically look carefully at government spending to see if it's consumption or investment, because this kind of spending is less productive for the economy than investment spending is. And that ratchets up uh, the deficit. As I said, it's now at 30.6 trillion. In the long run, federal investment, which is the investment spending, has fallen. And here's a graph of it. So this is U.S. government, the federal government spending as a percent of GDP. And you can see that it was up around the 2% range in 1970, and it fell all the way down to half a percentage point. There was a little bump up, but it's back down again. So in the long run, the government budget is not spending its money on investment projects, and it needs to do more of that. The recent bills that have passed um, are a little bit of a different story. The American Rescue Plan, which was the uh, stimulus package to fight against the COVID downturn, that was mostly consumption money. That was giving checks away to people. And it had a big uh, a negative impact on the, the deficit. It really raised it quite a bit. But the next three laws that came along were really kind of investment types of um, spending, which was something a little bit new for the for the budget sp spending. The bipartisan infrastructure law was the first one that got passed. Uh, we, we know that they uh, that provided 550 billion of new money. It was meant, mostly went for roads. However, it was way too small for water infrastructure and rail transit. There was nothing in this bill for affordable housing, which is a big problem for our economy. And this bill has a little bit of problems rolling out its spending plan uh, because half of the money is competitive grants and a lot of um, legislatures don't have the, um, the manpower capacity to compete for these grants. So it's gonna be a slow process to roll this money out. The next bill that came along was the Chips and Science Act. That was $280 billion in subsidies and tax credits so that we can do more chip manufacturing, semiconductor manufacturing within the United States. And curiously, a lot of Republicans voted for this package to get it passed. Um, it, and they were really concerned about competitiveness with China. And if they're concerned about competitiveness with China over over uh, semiconductors, they should also worry about the whole infrastructure package as well. And then the Inflation Reduction Act, which just recently passed, is now providing $375 billion of new money for renewable energy generation and tax credits for solar panels in your house or to purchase an electric vehicle. Um, curiously, to get that um, passed uh, with uh, Kirsten Cinema from Arizona, they inserted at the last minute $4 billion to address Western drought. 
That'll be mostly through conservation, but we really need billions and billions of dollars to address the Western drought uh, problem. There's nothing in this bill, the final bill compared to the Build Back Better omitted anything for high-speed rail and it omitted any money for electricity transmission. So if we're going to have a lot more electric cars, we need to have more transmission capacity to move renewable energy around the, the country. And then the tax increases will do maybe a little bit for inflation, but not a whole lot. And the claims to reduce CO2 emissions by 40%, well, we'll have to see if that bill and those electric vehicles are really able to reduce CO2 emissions by that much. We still face a huge traffic congestion problem in the United States. This is my favorite road in Northern Virginia, just south of Washington, DC, I-95, five lanes wide in each direction. And this is what a typical rush hour looks like. And you get charged tolls for your experience of waiting in all this traffic and you're out offloading in all of our uh, congested roads across our nation. We're offloading 58 super tankers worth of gasoline per year, which we could be saving if we could solve our traffic congestion problems. Electric vehicles won't do that, but the National Infrastructure Bank will because it's gonna put a lot more rail into the transportation mix. So let's remind ourselves again, what the NIB is going to cover. $5 trillion in projects. It's a quantum leap higher than anything that's financed through the budget. According to the, the American Society of Civil Engineers, that's how much money we need to repair our transportation systems, our water systems, upgrade our electric power grid. And then if we're going to fix our congestion problems and save on fuel from, tra from transportation, we really need to have a high-speed rail network across our country and much more rail and commuter rail in our transportation mix. We need to get broadband out into every single corner of the country. Affordable housing is a huge problem. We need to have the money to, for affordable housing for the very low income portion of our um, citizenry that is that is really suffering from inflation, uh, from high food prices, high gas prices, and high housing prices. Uh, if we could build these 7 million units, we would really have a big relief for them. And then the large scale water projects are gonna need a lot more than just a little bit of conservation and cutting off farmers and ranchers from, from water supplies. We're going to need big ticket uh, spending on water projects to get water into the Southwest. So a better way to fight inflation, save jobs and curve a recession is to use a national infrastructure bank. In the short run, run, it can lean against any recession that might come along. It can start with all the backlog of projects that are sitting in every legislator's budgets uh, that has not been able to be covered by their monthly, by their yearly budgets. It'll create millions of family sustaining jobs. It lends only to the real sector. It is the best kind of investment you can make. Uh, it plows back five, uh, five to $7 into the economy for every dollar that you borrow from the NIB for an infrastructure project, benefits workers, helps to resolve supply chain issues in ports, trucking, housing, and other kinds of bottlenecks. It'll uh, work against this problem of concentration of business by growing a lot of a lot more small businesses to uh, build all this infrastructure. It has a climate change portion because it uh, emphasizes transportation and agriculture. It'll substantially raise economic growth and productivity and all without any new inflation uh, because it will produce, the economy will produce more, it'll be more efficient and no new federal spending, taxes, or debt. So Republicans and Democrats should be able to come on board. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thanks, Alfeca, for that uh, great overview. That was quite a lot of information. And I do wanna thank uh, everyone in the audience who is posting in the chat. We have some interesting comments there and I just wanna encourage people to uh, put your questions and, and comments in the chat. I think it's very educational. Uh, now for our next speaker, we have the esteemed Edward Cornell Professor of Law and Finance from Cornell University in uh, New York. Um, please welcome Professor Robert Hockett. Uh, you've got the floor. 
Right. Thanks so much, Julie. And thanks, uh, thanks for that, Alfeca. And, and thanks to all of you who are here. Um, I think maybe the best way that I can be halfway helpful here is to provide a little, provide a little bit of uh, sort of theoretic and, and historical context um, to what uh, Alfeca just said in order to sort of um, provide uh, a little bit of maybe a little bit of indication as to just how much more significant what Alfeca is, is talking about is than some people uh, without that context or background context might realize. Um, so to begin with, let's note something about Larry Summers and something about a lot of orthodox economists um, at the moment. Um, many orthodox economists at the moment seem to be fond of quoting uh, an old line of Milton Friedman's to the effect that <clears throat> inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, that quote itself is always and everywhere a half truth uh, at best. And if it's a half truth, then it's also a half falsehood. Why do I say that? Well, it's because inflation, uh, like deflation, is a relation, if you'll pardon me for rhyming here. Uh, in other words, it's a relation between two quantities. And it's nicely captured, this relation is, uh, in the sort of homespun wisdom or the old adage that you've probably heard uh, to the effect that inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. Right. So if inflation is a relation between the money supply and the goods supply, or between what the Keynesians would call effective demand and effective supply, then you might wonder, well, why is it that somebody like Milton Friedman would only refer to one side of that relation? Why would the reference be only to the money supply or only to money or only to monetary phenomena? Um, and the answer is, I think, maybe um, found in a particular blind spot or a particular sort of how should I put it, a, a kind of a, a, a sort of a partial lobotomy, you might say, um, that seems to have been suffered by contemporary economic orthodoxy. And that's essentially a blindness to supply and therefore a blindness to production, right? The sort of activity that provides us with supplies. All of that seems to have been overlooked or to have been forgotten by contemporary economic orthodoxy. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of hard to understand why? You know, where did that come from? Where does that blind spot come from? Um, if we take Larry Summers in particular as a kind of a case study, we find something of a clue or something in the way of a hint and an answer to that. Um, Alfeca and I both have a history with the Bretton Woods institutions, with the International Monetary Fund on the one hand, and its so-called sibling or sister institution across the street, the World Bank, uh, on the other hand. Uh, and Alfeca will remember, as I remember, that Larry Summers was once the chief economist over at the World Bank across the street from the fund where she and I both worked. And probably uh, Larry Summers' best known legacy from his World Bank days is an infamous memo that he put out or circulated back in 1993, I believe it was. Alfeca can correct me if I'm wrong. But back in 1993, Larry Summers suggested that in the global economy that was then emerging, the comparative advantage of the African nations that were beginning to try to develop, the comparative advantage that they had in the global economy was essentially to take the toxic waste produced by the so-called developed world. In other words, the easiest way for African countries to add value to the global economy and the best way for them to make a buck, so to speak, in the global economy would be essentially to take toxic wastes from developed countries and be paid to sort of harbor those wastes. Now, this was a, a rather inhuman sort of thing uh, for anybody to be suggesting, let alone um, the chief economist at the world's most important development bank. Um, and of course, Summers took, I think with justice, a great deal of heat for this. But the argument that he gave in, you know, sort of in behalf of this claim was a, a textbook Ricardian comparative advantage argument, right? The argument was, look, given the current capacities of the various countries of the world to produce, and given the fact that the African economies at that point were not industrialized yet, their comparative advantage, according to economic orthodoxy, against standard Ricardian comparative advantage theory, was indeed to take that toxic waste and make that their sort of value added to the global economy. Now, what's the problem with that when you get right down to it? Well, it's not with the economic soundness of Summers' claim, at least if the standard of economic soundness is Ricardian comparative advantage. The problem was with Ricardian comparative advantage theory itself, right? With economic orthodoxy itself. And the problem more specifically with that particular orthodoxy is that it takes as fate or as quote unquote exogenous, 
that which is actually a subject of choice, that is something which ought to be considered to be endogenous, something that is to say over which we have control, over which we have human power, right? In other words, your capacities, what you're able to deliver, what you're able to produce in an economy is essentially the result of collective decision-making or collective choice of policy, in other words. It's not God-given, it's not natural in any sort of non-human sense of, of natural. Uh, and that is indeed the problem, right? Treating as fate what is a matter of choice. Now, let's think about this in historical perspective for a moment. At the time that the American nation became a separate country, a country in its own right, rather than simply a collection of colonies subject to British jurisdiction. At the time, in other words, that political independence was won in 1783, the new United States' comparative advantage in the late 18th century global economy was not unlike that which Larry Summers attributed to Africa some 200 years later. Right. In other words, in the 1780s, the comparative advantage of the, the former British colonies was to continue as economic colonies, even if they weren't political colonies anymore. In other words, the, the easiest, the, the comparative advantage, the, the, the sort of low hanging fruit for the American economy in the late 18th century would have been to continue simply to supply unfinished goods to the metropole, to London, to Britain, basically to send beaver pelts and wood and you know, raw materials of that sort to the British Isles who already were developing, they already had some factories, right? They had begun their industrial revolution. So the comparative advantage for the US would have been simply to keep sending unfinished goods to Britain and let Britain finish them and do all the value adding and then export them back to us. And we'd have to work like hell in order to be able to afford even just a, a modicum of finished goods unless we produce them ourselves. Um, and so the US would have remained uh, in effect a kind of neo-colony of Great Britain if we had followed that sort of Ricardian sort of advice ourselves or if we had followed a Larry Summers back 200 years before Larry Summers was around. But we didn't do that. We had a rather a, a much more visionary sort of leadership uh, and that visionary leadership was I think best sort of represented by its most sort of glowing star. Uh, and that was of course, Alexander Hamilton, who sort of understood that if you're going to have political autonomy, if you're going to be a politically independent nation, then you have to be a sort of economically independent nation too. You have to be an economically autonomous nation too. And the best way to do that was to develop, in effect, a diversified economy that would be partly agricultural, partly industrial, partly commercial, and that basically the whole gamut of human productive abilities and human productive capacities would be represented by this diversified economy. But he also understood that that doesn't just happen naturally. It doesn't just happen as a matter of sort of spontaneous evolution without anybody's exercising any kind of will to realize any particular design or any particular kind of plan, you have to sort of think it through and you have to take charge of it collectively and make it happen. And doing that in, in, in turn involves understanding the comparative advantages, if I can use that phrase again, of the public sector on the one hand and the private sector on the other hand, when it comes to constituting an autonomous economy that is diversified and that is in effect, a mixed economy, as all successful economies always have been. And this is just a long-winded way of saying that Hamilton understood that the country had to become productive, right? We had to be able to produce and to produce for ourselves in order not to remain a colony forever and not then 200 years later to have Larry Summers telling us that our comparative advantage is just to take other people's toxic waste. Happily, Africa didn't take uh, Summers' advice either, by the way, uh, and, and, and Africa is now one of the most rapidly growing uh, economy. The, the African economy as a whole is one of the world's most rapidly developing and one of the world's most rapidly industrializing. And also, of course, the African population is among the world's fastest growing. So Africa is going to be a very important sort of presence in the global economy in the near term future. But if it had listened to Larry Summers 30 some odd years ago, of course, there'd be no chance of that any more than the American economy would have become that if we had listened to the equivalent of the Larry Summers types back in the late 18th century. Now let's fast forward then, let's come back to the present and back to Elfeka's um, uh, observations uh, and contribution. 
Larry Summers is at it again, right? In the same way that he took as fate what was in fact a matter of choice in 1993 in advising what the African economies should do, he's now effectively telling us that, well, you know, we can't really do anything about the supply side of the economy any more than Africa could have done anything about the supply side of its economies 30 years ago, and any more than the, the uh, US economy in the late 18th century could have taken charge of its own capacities to produce and supply itself. The American economy is just sort of stuck with the supplies that it has. And so all you can do if you've got an inflation problem, you can't really do anything on the goods side of the equation. You can only work on the monetary side of the equation, or you can't do anything on the supply side of the equation. You can only deal with the demand side of the equation. And therefore, let's constrict demand, right? Let's just slam the brakes on consumer demand or on what the Keynesians would call effective demand in the economy by suddenly tightening up on the money supply. But again, he's making the same mistake in this connection as he did in those other connections that I was just talking about. It simply is not the case that the supplies available to us are somehow a product of fate. It's not as though produced goods uh, or produced services or provided services are simply manna from heaven. We produce goods, right? Or we refrain from producing goods. Now, over the last 30 years or so, not coincidentally, the time period during which Larry Summers has been an important economic advisor to various presidential administrations, the US has been busily outsourcing its productive capacities elsewhere. It's been busily offshoring its own capacities to supply itself and produce for itself over the same period of time during which Larry Summers has been an important economic advisor listened to by administrations of both parties. And of course, during the time that he was also an advisor at that Bretton Woods institution known as the World Bank. It's been a terrible mistake as you might've thought. And one of the things that the pandemic has done is to sort of underscore or to sort of highlight the fact, the sense in which we've been in effect unilaterally disarming ourselves or unilaterally disabling ourselves from producing to satisfy our own needs, our own wants, our own demands. And what we've been doing instead is bringing it all in from elsewhere because we outsourced to places where we could exploit labor more easily than we can exploit labor here in the US. Although it's now become of course much more easy to exploit labor in the US too because we keep telling them that they have to compete with essentially effectively slave labor or indentured labor elsewhere. But in any event, we've been doing all of this in order to sort of, again, uh, cheapen production costs, but that's rendered us dependent on sources of supply that were easily disrupted by things like pandemic. It seems then to me that a much more sensible way to deal with the inflation problems that have emerged is to sort of reestablish and reconstitute our productive capacities, to reshore our productive facilities, to insource the stuff that we've been outsourcing, thanks to people like Larry Summers over the last 30 years, so that we can operate on, again, the goods side of the money chasing goods equation or the supply side of the demand and supply relation. And that's exactly the kind of thing that the NIB assists us in doing, because you can't reshore productive capacity and you can't rebuild or reconstitute factories or build new institutions that can produce the new products of tomorrow, essentially the eco-friendly products of tomorrow, like solar cells, like um, solar arrays, like windmills, like electric vehicles, like batteries, like heat pumps, like all the kind, the high-speed rail, all the kinds of things that we're going to have to produce in the future. You can't do that if you don't have the basic infrastructure on which all those productive units tend to depend. And so going forward with a plan like the NIB plan is a prerequisite to resting control again, to retaking control of our own productive destiny, our own productive capacity. And doing that in turn then is also, a, well, doing that is a, accordingly also a prerequisite to getting a handle on inflation problems because the best way, and really ultimately in the long term, the only way to deal with our problems is to begin producing again and producing in ways that are sustainable given the environmental constraints that we have to deal with. 
And the, the only way to do that is, again, to sort of start publicly investing again. And the best way to begin publicly investing again in that particular way is through some such institution as the NIB, which, thank heavens, Elfeka and her crew have already thought through quite carefully and have gotten signed on to by many members of the US Congress already. And of course, part of our task here tonight is to try to get more sign up from more of them. But anyway, I hope that that will suffice for now uh, to sort of lay out some sort of context to, against which, again, I think the, 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 the signal importance um, of the NIB will be all the more uh, readily appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Hawk. I appreciate that. Um, we are now going to go to our next speaker, and that would be Dr. Nomi Prinz, who is an author and former Wall Street executive uh, from Los Angeles, California. Dr. Prinz, you've got the floor. Thank you. Um, it's it's so interesting to actually be discussing what Larry Summers actually thinks, because that presupposes he thinks, and. <laughs> That's really unclear. Um, you know, Larry Summers is obviously not connected for very many reasons, and that's maybe a separate topic for another time to the real economy and what people's perceptions of the real economy is to them. And so to blanket say something, whether it's for effect, whether it's because it helps his businesses, it just doesn't even matter. But to actually take that public platform and say anything that involves hurting uh, people's livelihoods by taking their jobs away in the interest of you know, fighting an inflation that has nothing to do with them working um, is just, you know, it's just Larry Sumner's showing that he's an idiot again, um, quite frankly. So, um, and, 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 and that's just the case. I mean, again, many, 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 many examples of that, but, but, it's, but it's also dangerous because part of the rhetoric that goes around um, sort of external discourse in terms of what Larry Summers has said goes into the fact that, well, okay, but the government also stimulates and some of that money went into inflation and that caused, you know, gas prices to rise, which it didn't. It just has this whole knock-on effect in terms of distorting um, what, what we all know to be economics. Um, and the Federal Reserve has, has kind of crescendo this distortion by um, basically printing money, fabricating electronically money in order to purchase debt, which is why, you know, as, as Alfeca noted in, in one of her many awesome slides, you know, we have $30 trillion um, or more in debt. We don't have that much debt um, because we're growing our economy and we're using that debt in order to grow our economy. If we were doing that, Larry Summers would not be able to say something as dumb as let's get rid of jobs in order to grow our economy, because like then who would be growing it? And, and so just, just from going backwards into this um, and talking about the National Infrastructure Bank, the reality is we don't have enough funds because the debt that we have created for various purposes has not gone back into the real economy in enough of a way and with enough long-term planning and enough sustained development in order to give us a, a, a foundation that makes people comfortable and that makes us actually move forward, um, you know, whether that's from a new energy perspective, from an, electri an electrification perspective, to have grids that actually work so that when we do attach EVs and we do work on different kinds of renewable power, we actually have a transmission source in order to be able to get it from wherever it's located into the smallest towns and homes across the United States, which, by the way, should also be replicated around the world. Um, and, and so just looking at the math of it, we have a situation where um, I think it is good that there was a bipartisan infrastructure act passed. And we've, we've talked about that because it was bipartisan. Um, and also because it at least noted that after decades of not having a, a chunk of money, let's just say available to build our economy from the ground up and underground up, um, that we actually could allocate into that pot. And then currently with the Inflation Reduction Act, which I don't think actually reduces inflation at the moment, but it it, it can have an impact, um, you know, in, in terms of that supply side uh, creation. If we are able to create supply here from the standpoint of um, actually refining materials here, whether it's rare earths for electric vehicles and, 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 and sort of alternative battery sources, whether it's renewable energy or whatever it is, we have the ability to, to supply that from here, which also includes 
employing people to expand that supply chain in order to actually create more jobs, which is okay um, if they are actually keeping up with the growth in the economy. And as Alfeca also noted, the wages right now aren't even keeping up with the inflation that we have anyway, which just goes back to the fact that Larry Summers is stupid. So, so what we have now um, is to convince, and I think ultimately that's what we here all want to do, is to convince more people, um, i.e. Congress people, on both sides of the aisle, that it makes sense to actually supplement funding and tax incentives that have been made available by these acts to actually get from point A to B and actually build, produce, and have long-term growth here so that we can control our supply chains better, so we don't have to actually worry about the fact that adding jobs is, is a good or bad thing because it will just be adding jobs into that economic growth and into that energy growth, um, and it will make sense, and we need the extra money to be able to do that. Now, Wall Street was a big recipient of a lot of money when the Fed went nuts and started to basically go into QE on steroids, or at least steroids part one, in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, right? We, we, we've all gone through this. You know, banks mess up, over leverage, say it's Main Street's fault, and then basically get four and a half trillion dollars worth of money fabricated by the Fed to buy a combination of treasury debt, of which they're primary dealers, and mortgage debt, which they messed up. And so basically that was just kind of the, the initial stand initial point, um, which then doubled to $9 trillion of electric money fabrication in order to buy more debt in the wake of the pandemic. So we had a situation where there was monetary inflation. There was absolutely monetary inflation and not just like when gas prices went up, there's been monetary inflation since and and sort of before but let's just call it since the financial crisis of 2008 started when the fed went from a book of 800 billion dollars to what's now almost nine trillion dollars and a couple steps along the way along which mostly rates were zero or near zero and if they weren't zero here they're on average zero throughout the developed world um that's monetary inflation that's why as el mentioned, that's why we have asset inflation. That's why there is such a distortion between financial assets, the stock market, leveraged funds on Wall Street, banks, BlackRock, and, and, and the like, because that's where money can reproduce itself most quickly. Money cannot reproduce itself really quickly when it's trying to build a new power plant, or when it's trying to build new solar panels across the Midwest, or when it's trying to build new you know, wind turbines outside of the main states of Texas or California, wherever they are right now. It, 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 those things take a long time. Those things take a committed investment. They take a relationship between seed money from the government, private money from companies, small and larger, um, that are regional as well as that can basically work across states so that we can actually have better networks, platforms, and sources for energy um, going forward, because that is ultimately how we power um, our economy. The National Infrastructure Bank allows that money to be supplanted. It allows the money that's on offer that has been voted on in various ways, and hopefully the IRA will pass as well, um, by the government as at least a recognition that this is happening. This, this energy transition, this, this idea of infrastructure development this is all happening right now and it needs to happen for whatever the reasons. And the NIB actually goes into the bank model that Wall Street used all day long and has gotten bailed out of for various reasons and floats on $9 trillion of Fed money and all the other money across the world that other banks float on as well. And instead of doing that, this basically takes some of the debt that was created, that was bought by some of this money and repurposes it into long-term, productive, stable, economic, environmentally friendly, human-friendly um, projects and endeavors. So again, how do you get Congress on both sides of the aisle um, and, and there's a lot of signatures um, and, and that's also, how do you get like literally everyone to sign on? Um, and, and I think that has to be our goal. Obviously, that's not going to happen. We only got a 50-50 with a tie break on the IRA and the Senate. I mean, obviously, this is not like an easy thing. Um, so we're dealing with, you know, a, an incredibly unnecessarily, I think, partisan situation with respect to some of this development. Um, but then we also have bipartisan votes on things like chips. So, I mean, there, there, is, there is some common ground and maybe that's where we start from. You know, how does the NIB actually at least attack the common ground without 
again, creating more debt, repurposing debt that's already been created, using money that's already been allocated, and actually taking it from the point of allocation through however many different Congresses are voted in over the years it takes to build what we need to build, um, and not just what we're envisioning today, but what we envision as we go forward, and finances it. And that brings in external investment, that brings in individual investment, that actually returns more money to people who are invested in institutions and states and companies that are invested in that process, then debt takes away from our economy and creates a greater distortion between people that use that leveraged debt to speculate and to work the financial asset markets and those who live in the real economy and go to work every single day and want to have clean air and clean water and efficient energy and not pay their electricity bills with their credit cards because that's the situation right now because we don't have as efficient um, a network a grid as we should and as we need to get. So that's the thing, Let, convincing these people like one by one, and I know this is happening, um, but, but, but that's literally it. Like, what is the alternative? Is the alternative to just have this money set aside and not use it or not finish projects? Because then all, I mean, that's what's been happening. Um, or is it to basically augment it with enough capital so that we can actually get stuff done? Most people, when you when you say it like that, even if you know whatever side of the aisle they're on, most people should want to get stuff done. So you work backwards. Okay, do you want to get stuff done? All right, well, here's a way you can do that. These other ways get you part of part of the road. But but this is a financing mechanism that will be there. Um, and that will help to get stuff done and then to move forward from that. And uh, I think that just has to be the message. It's, it's, it's not political and it's, it's about money. Um, it's merely a more efficient way of augmenting money that's available to make it longer standing and to bring it into projects so that they can actually get completed so that we can all sort of have high fives. Whoever's involved in the completion, the workers, the companies, the politicians that pushed it, you know, wherever they are, local, national, just doesn't, doesn't matter. And, and, and sort of, you know, raise a hand, have a victory lap and move on to the next project. That's Thank all I have to say right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate your, uh, your plain spoken remarks there. And I'd just like to take a minute to um, note that Richard Lippin in the chat uh, was asking if our great experts we have on the panel are banned from mainstream media. So uh, thank you for that comment. There have been a lot of positive comments in the chat about our speakers. And I do want to say that um, we are doing a podcast and we are also, we will have a video of this panel up on our website within 48 hours. And so we really encourage everyone here to share it out on your social media so that we can get these experts the, the attention that they deserve and, and help educate um, our fellow Americans. So with that, let's move on to our, our next speaker. And I would like to bring you Ellen Brown, who is the uh, chair of the Public Banking Institute. Ellen? Thanks, Julie. Yeah, so everyone's gone into uh, Larry Summers pretty much and what he's up to, but uh, the whole idea was that you reduce demand by reducing the ability of consumers to pay, which was heavily criticized as uh, throwing more than 10 million people out of work. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez criticized it. She said uh, um, it's reckless to manufacture a recession, which is what that would do. In, that it would devastate our most vulnerable. And Liz Warren said that um, it was short-sighted and dangerous. And Bernie Sanders actually criticized the Inflation Reduction Act. He said that uh, he quoted a nonpartisan review that showed it would have a minimal effect on inflation. So then you wonder why they called it the nonpartisan, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there was a nonpartisan tax foundation report that said that it would increase unemployment and taxes over overall. So it does sound like the summer's playbook. That was the whole idea. But I guess I don't, maybe I should skip this slide because I don't want to get too controversial. But anyway, there's, um, you know, a big issue about who these 78 thousand new tax collectors are going to go after are they going to go after supposedly they're going to go after the rich but there was a proposed amendment uh limiting new taxes to earners over four hundred thousand dollars and it didn't pass and um there was a study that showed that 
rich people don't cheat on their taxes. They hire tax attorneys to make sure that everything is legal. What they do is they find tax lo loopholes. So if you want to change that, you know, if you want to hit up the rich people, you actually have to change the tax laws. And I think that Bernie Sanders is now proposing such a um, such legislation. And then if you raise taxes on the corporations, um, <clears throat> You will, they will, of course, just increase their prices, which means we'll still wind up paying for it. So, and in any case, these bills that have passed or we expect to pass are not covering the really important infrastructure that um, LPEC and everybody else has pointed out um, so far. So what the Chinese are doing are what exactly what Roosevelt did. Uh, as soon as he got into office, he jumped right into these projects. So that's the way, how the Chinese are dealing with this um, recession that's pretty much global. Um, in the last year from July 20, year, year over year from to July 2022, they increased investment growth by 15%. Uh, and they've, uh, started construction on nearly 4,000 large projects across the country. And the way they fund it is through, they have these three giant public infrastructure and development banks, which are called policy banks. And they're limited to funding um, uh, infrastructure and development. <clears throat> and one of, the, one of their big projects that uh, it was ongoing, but they've made progress on it, is uh, linking the, their two big mega water infrastructures, the Three Gorges Project and the North to South, um, South, sorry, South to North Water Diversion Project. And the total tab on that is uh, the equivalent of $470 billion. Well, as Elfeka pointed out, um, the HR 3339 would allocate 400 billion for drought in the Southwest, which is where most of our agriculture or most of, half of our food for the country comes from. So that's, it would be doing pretty much what the Chinese are doing for water development. And the way they are funding it in the second half of 2022, they'll be um, coming up with the equivalent of $164 billion, uh, partly from financial bonds and other instruments, but the, largely from credit lines from the policy banks. And where the policy banks get their liquidity is from the central bank, the public bank of China. So that is essentially the Alexander Hamilton model, where you take, you leverage credit on the books of a bank. Um, in Hamilton's day, you could do 10 to one where you had a certain amount of capital and then you could, you know, it was called fractional reserve lending and you could lend 10 times that amount. It's just created as uh, credit on, on the books. Uh, today, they've eliminated, uh, the Fed has eliminated the reserve requirement. So in the Euro dollar market, for example, which the Fed has no control over, they can create as much money as they want on the books because but anyway, the point is you create the credit first um, oh. and then you build something and whatever you built pays back the loan. Uh, that was the Bank of England model, but the difference, or the, sorry, the fractional reserve lending was the Bank of Eng England model, but the difference was Bank of England um, was the purpose from the pre creditor's point of view was to make profits. And the, from the government's point of view, it was to fund wars. So Hamilton said in his policy papers that the point of the bank was to fund manufacturing and development. Uh, the first US bank really didn't do too much in, in, in that way, but the second US bank did a great deal of manufacturing and development. And of course, um, Roosevelt in the 1930s just really jumped in and did it. Uh, with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, but the Reconstruction Finance Corporation wasn't actually a bank. So rather than leveraging their capital, they issued bonds. And most of those bonds were sold to the treasury. And where did the treasury get the money? They obviously went into debt. Um, so I won't go into too much of that. But anyway, uh, local governments that were already up to their borrowing limit with their uh, uh, general obligation bonds, um, developed this new way of borrowing, relatively new, called revenue bonds, where you could back your loan not with 
like taxpayer money that you already had, but with but with with the um, proceeds of the loan that you were taking out. So so for example, if it was a loan to build a dam, the electricity, the fees from the dam would pay off the loan. And then um, that stimulated local economies so much that the local local governments did get more revenues in, and that they could use that money then with for projects that weren't self-funding. For example, we had all this amazing artwork during the 1930s. In fact, there was an in, intentional art. It was part of the. Uh, um, I've forgotten the name of it, but anyway, the, you, you know these beautiful, like in Los Angeles where I live, the railroad station, which is just a railroad station, has this amazing artwork on the on the ceilings, uh, and the, this these pictures here are from the Gulf Building in Houston, which is the city of Jesse Jones, who was the mastermind of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So we could do that again. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation was not a bank, but the National Infrastructure Bank will be a depository bank. So it can leverage its capital at 10 to one or even more, depending on what the Fed's rules are these days. And then um, the, as, as those loans, as infrastructure is built, the economy will be stimulated. This is not just a theory, it actually happened in the 1930s. And that extra money then can go to fund projects that are not self-funding. So we too can rebuild the country and create a 21st century uh, re renaissance. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Appreciate your remarks. Um, we are going to um, uh, try to move through the, our remaining speakers kind of quickly because we're um, we're um, at that point in the program. And so I would like to introduce from Anacortes, Washington. Uh, Washington State, State Senator Liz Lovelett. Senator. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, so I'm going to try to take this back from like a national level down back to the community level. So uh, by way of background, I live in Anacortes. I represent um, in the northwest corner of Washington State, the beautiful San Juan Islands and western portions of some of our rural counties that have a lot of agriculture, a lot of flood damage uh, and proximity to wildfires. So as a city council member, uh, what we see on that community level is the fact that infrastructure is not being paid for. So we have all of these needs, all of these desires and all of these visioning exercises that we do in order to execute the vision of how we transition through climate change, how we adapt to climate change over time. And the cities and especially our rural areas are, are most uh, impacted in so many ways. We are on the flood plain. We do have our housing developments adjacent to wildfire areas. Uh, we do provide all of the services in terms of water conveyance, in terms of sewage treatment, uh, in terms of waste, uh, you know, just pulling together people's solid waste and making sure that it's being dealt with appropriately. Uh, so what we find again and again is that our vision in climate resiliency is not matching the capital that we that is required to execute that vision. And that additionally, we have all of these manufacturing facilities around the United States that are in small towns across America uh, that require a just transition. So I've been thinking uh, for my own refineries, I live in a town that has some of the most pristine natural wildlife in the world. We have the last of the iconic uh, native killer whale species, and we have four or five refineries uh, for Washington State that connects us to California in terms of oil, liquid transportation fuel production. So we have this really precarious tension between the work that has traditionally been available for people and uh, the ability for our climate to continue to thrive. So I think that these small towns across America are the perfect place to illustrate the efficacy of something like a national infrastructure bank. Uh, we can basically meet the cost differential between the routine maintenance that is required to make sure that we have stormwater management, to make sure that we have proper waste management of, of solids, of our compost, all of these different things that we go from the, the nice to have to the need to have very quickly uh, when it comes to 
what our community is asking for. I've been trying to keep track of some of the questions in the chat because I think that this is kind of where the rubber meets the road on many of these things. Workforce development, yes, that is an obvious challenge. Even if we were able to turn around and have all of the trillions of dollars that would be necessary to fix our uh, failing, our crumbling roll, roads, our failing bridges, uh, we would need to have uh, an augmentation of our workforce pipeline and to make sure that people are being trained up in a way that allows them to enter these trades and perform the work. I uh, happen to be an AmeriCorps alum. I did the uh, National Civilian Community Corps right out of high school. Uh, and I think that AmeriCorps is an awesome way to be able to tie young people into the trades. They could be doing those kinds of uh, kind of low hanging things like weatherizing homes. One of the ways that we can start having climate justice, that we can start having racial justice and economic justice is making sure that the homes that people live in are both affordable in terms of energy costs, but that they're also, we're improving their indoor air quality because we know that systemic racism has placed them in places that have higher levels of pollution, higher level of lung disease, higher levels of heart disease. We have the data that pinpoints exactly where these neighborhoods are. And I think at a time when we have seen seen uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, where we have seen such gains in immigrant justice in the farm worker communities across the United States. Right now is the time to start making investments in these communities to really follow through again with this vision that we have that we haven't had the concrete steps. So the way I got involved in this group is because I've been on the team for Washington State to create our own state bank for many years now. Um, I was a city council member for a little over five years and then I was appointed to the legislature and for me, coming from a local government perspective, which is the nonpartisan world, right, to the guy's comment about we, it, the easiest way to communicate things is to say, we want to fill the pothole in front of your house. And that's really as basic as it gets, because if we're talking about kind of the political liability that goes with supporting something like this, it really comes down to how is government working for me? And when you break it down to its most base elements, it's that we need to be impacting the effects of climate change by using this as an opportunity to pivot for economic development development, that your very real needs in terms of energy costs, in terms of liquid transportation fuel costs, are really hurting families that were already on the margins, and the pandemic and the supply chain challenges have not done anything to fix that, and that really this is a nonpartisan issue, right? If you talk to my colleagues across the aisle, they will say infrastructure, 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 but where this has the potential to go sideways is this is disruptive to Wall Street, right? Like this is the place where we're saying that we're not going to necessarily need as many muni bonds coming out of Wall Street, that where we have local governments that are required to keep external liquid assets, whether you're at the local level or at the county level, uh, that's a lot of assets that are currently being invested in big oil and in Fannie and Freddie. And we could be pulling that out and using our American tax dollars to fund American projects. And that's what I have found has resonated across the board is when I talk about Washington state tax dollars working for Washingtonians to make sure that we're putting people back to work and we're preventing the kind of catastrophic damage that is now what FEMA is responding to all the time, right? Like FEMA is coming in now because the Nooksack Valley in Whatcom County flooded again this year. And it's not, it's the hundred year flood again this year. And we simply can't afford to bail people out. So I think this kind of forward thinking that we're talking about where we are tying it to not only infrastructure, we're tying it to climate resiliency, we're tying it to the concept of a just transition for workers. I think about the guys out at Lockheed Martin, maybe there's a new future for them where they don't have to be involved in the in the business of war anymore. I think about those guys that are in the coal mines. They don't want to be in the business of creating a legacy of lung cancer for them and their families forever. That was one of the places I went in AmeriCorps that blew my mind is I ended up in the in the hills of rural West Virginia. There is nothing out there for those folks. There is no job opportunities and that disingenuousness of, oh, just go get a job manufacturing solar panels. Well, where is that job for them? It doesn't exist. And when you talk to people in the eastern part of my state, who they are 50 miles from the grocery store and you tell them, go ahead and get an electric car, they're gonna say, where do I charge it? Well, these are the kinds of things that we can really meet problems head on and give people opportunities to really ensure that they can be part of this transition. Because at the end of the day, if we do not use this moment to make climate change the way we transform our, eco our economy, the way that we rebuild our middle class, the way that we help people have off ramps to exit poverty, and we leave them behind with higher energy costs, higher food costs, 
the wealth stratification is just going to continue to get more extreme. And I personally can't stomach that. So as the vice chair, of, uh, vice chair of the Energy and Environment Committee, I root my work in a few things. One, that climate justice and racial justice are often the same. That we have to enfranchise making sure that poor folks across our country, across our state, people that have limited means, have the ability to invest in the technologies of the future so that they're not left behind and to really meet people where they are. To go to my Republican colleagues and say that they don't care about climate change falls really flat because the reality is they just call it something different. They call it extreme weather events. They call it flooding. They call it wildfires. You know, we don't have to dither around on semantics when we could really spend time getting to the nitty gritty, which is, do you want to solve problems about that guy's pothole in front of his house? Because I want to make sure that that guy's pothole gets filled in. And so sometimes by just taking a less antagonistic approach, I think we can build the coalition that will be necessary to get this to the finish line. And for me, I have strong relationships with my congressional delegation. So when I talk to my local city council members and mayors and county commissioners, and I get them to pass resolutions that say we're in support of the public bank, we're in support of the infrastructure bank, it comes up to my level. Washington State passed a joint memorial to say that we believe in the, in the ability for the National Infrastructure Bank to create real meaningful change in our communities. That is when it's able to put the political pressure across all of the political spectrum to say that we can make this happen. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of a little awestruck to be on this panel. Uh, I mean, I know I've been working on this for some time, but I think the more that we can bring this down to a really localized level, and again, we go out there and we say, we want to make sure that you're getting an economy that works for you. And, you know, quite frankly, most of them do not have the bandwidth, the time, the resources to care about how we get there. And so being able to communicate that this is about building the middle class, making sure that our dollars are going to work for our country and that we are transforming our economy through the power of infrastructure. And the last thing I wanna leave you with is, with is just the idea, why do we do this? Because infrastructure is a forever problem. Once we get through this first tranche of money, the next trillion dollars, guess what? That pothole in front of his house is going to be back again. And we're going to need to come back and repave it. We're going to need to update our water treatment plant. We're going to need to make sure that our uh, storm drainage is really providing the efficacy that it needs. So these are not facilities that are ever going to go away. It's going to be a forever problem. And we need to make sure that we're capitalizing this on the long term and making sure that we have the workforce and the community buy-in to really make it effective. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Senator Lovelett. That was uh, really wonderful um, to hear from you on uh, the impact of a national infrastructure bank at the at the local level. So certainly, uh, we appreciate the our economists uh, laying out the theory for us. But if it's never uh, implemented, it, it doesn't get us anywhere. So really appreciate your insights on how to make it happen at the local level. And for another perspective on that, I'd now like to go to the other side of the country. Um, to Maine, we have with us Representative Lynn Williams from Bar Harbor, Maine. Representative Williams? Me, there you I are. You. Okay. Um, yes, thank you for having me. I have to echo what Senator Lovelet said. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and she's been working on this issue. I have only been working on this issue for two years. Um, I am in the house uh, in Maine. I, re I too represent rural communities. I represent half of Mount Desert Island and uh, the Cranberry Islands and uh, the town of Lemoyne, uh, rural area, uh, but we have a population of about a million now in the summer. Um, and I have long, however, been a um, proponent of infrastructure and infrastructure funding. I was a lobbyist before I got elected. I was a volunteer lobbyist, but I talked always to the legislature about we have to fund my favorite, which is rail, light rail and, and long, long rail. Um, we have some rail, the Down Easter, which is Amtrak, um, goes to Portland, Maine. We have two bills pending now. One would extend uh, that to um, up to Bangor, Maine, which is so important. And we, when Senator Lovelett spoke about uh, economic and social justice, um, this is the poorest county Washington County, Maine, is the poorest county in this country. 
these people have very little and they're not really connected to connect. And I, I've worked on various short-term transportation issues. These are people who don't have re um, reliable vehicles. They can't get to medical appointments. They can't really do very much of anything. Um, so I really wanna help people like this. We wanna get that train up to Bangor where there can be then probably bus systems hooked up to it. So we're working on that. The other thing, and we have a bill in for that. The other thing is extending um, from Portland, a light rail system to the town of Lewiston. Um, again, cars, th while this is a car state, this is not a reliable car state. Again, a lot of people don't have a lot of money. Plus, we have an increasing number of African immigrants coming now to Maine. Um, we have for, for many years um, when Somalis and Sudanese immigrants were coming. Now they are coming from increasing numbers of um, African nations. These are hardworking people. Their kids are enrolled in school as soon as they get here. Um, but they don't have vehicles and they need a way to get, they're getting jobs, you know, the sort of there's not enough workers, particularly in the hospitality industry in the summer. Um, so these folks are getting jobs, but they have to get there. So I'm trying to focus and work with um, work with other state legislators on this these issues. I am on the main uh, house, tra um, not the house, the legislative transportation committee. I'm the only woman on the committee and I'm probably going to be the next chair of the committee because seven people were termed out. <laughs> so, um, and I'm friends with the incoming speaker who's our first black woman speaker of the house. Um, and, and so I have my list of goals for that. Um, and of people who I'd like to appoint to the committee so we could focus very heavily and very clearly on public transportation issues, whatever they may be. Um, electric cars are not gonna solve Maine's transportation problems. Um, I'm in, Bar Harbor is a very upscale town. We have four charging stations. And so what are people going to do? They're going to just sit there and not be at home or not working. And so it just, and you know, if we don't have a lot of charging stations, any places north of here have zero charging stations. So electric vehicles are good. I support them, but they're not going to be the salvation for a state, state like this. So again, thank you for having me. And I loved hearing from everyone else who came before me. So I'm, I'm very excited to be working on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Williams. We appreciate your time uh, being here. And now I'd like to move on to our final speaker. And we have with us uh, James Lou Spencer, who is the Vice President of the Virginia State Building and Construction Council from Richmond, Virginia. Lou? Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Hello and good evening. My name is Lou Spencer. I'm the Assistant Business Manager of United Association Local Union Number no. 5, Plumbers and Gas Fitters, and I'm also the Vice President of the Virginia Building and Construction Trades Council. I support the National Infrastructure Bank. As you heard earlier, the economy is a mess and a fracas is unfolding on how to fix it. Let me take a few moments and explain what this means to the working families like the ones that belong to UA Local 5 plumbers and gas fitters. We have recently peacefully ratified another agreement with our signatory contractors. This is not surprising as UA Local 5 has a long history of carrying out peaceful, principled negotiations with our employers. That said, it is also important to look at our market and the world around us as it really is. Work is plentiful for the time being. However, inflation is high, interest rates are rising, and there's always uncertainty about the future. Amazingly, some policymakers are proposing even higher interest rates for the purpose of creating unemployment as a means of bringing down inflation. Incredibly, this nation and its elitist policymakers have adopted these strategies before. 
higher interest rates will subdue the commercial and residential construction markets simultaneously. Those of us old enough to remember the 1970s are well aware of this strategy and look upon it as a threat, not as a solution. If there is a downturn in the plumbing and construction markets, we will adapt. If construction falters, building owners will be forced to renovate and repair their existing structures and facilities, and we are planning for that downturn now. There is a better solution, the creation of a new national infrastructure bank. As expressed in HR 3339, this will allow the United States to build our way out of this predicament. The new national infrastructure bank will support trillions dedicated to infrastructure projects. This excellent program will cost the federal budget extraordinarily little next to nothing while creating millions of high paying jobs and bringing real solutions to transportation, manufacturing, while improving our standard of living. We know that infrastructure development needs uh, careful planning and a reliable source of long-term funding for it to succeed. It is most unlikely that the adequate infrastructure financing to cover all the nation's infrastructure needs will ever come from the federal budget. HR 3339 has been introduced into Congress to create the National Infrastructure Bank, and the bank is configured to attract maximum political support from both Republicans and Democrats in Congress. Infrastructure projects will be vetted according to their cost and by cost benefit analysis and a set of specific criteria set out in the bill. Our nation requires improved highways, roads, bridges, mass transit, water and wastewater treatment facilities, seaports, rail, electric power, te telecommunication systems and airports. The National Infrastructure Bank will uplift millions into respectable careers, build up and link up our urban and rural areas, support commerce and manufacturing, and restore a sense of dignity and confidence to our great nation. We are at that precise moment in history. The opportunities here now, we must act and future generations will thank us. Have a great evening and thanks for listening. Thank you, Lou, appreciate you being here. Uh, I know we've had uh, some other comments about jobs and where are we gonna find workers? So hopefully we'll uh, explore that topic uh, in the Q&A. And now before we go to the Q&A, I want to put somebody on the spot real briefly here. And I would like to call on State Representative Pat Boy from Indiana and uh, welcome you to our panel. And perhaps you could um, make a, a couple remarks about how the, the National Infrastructure Bank could help in Indiana. Uh, I wasn't expecting to speak at all here. <laughs> I have a little yeah. bit of trouble with my internet now and then, but I'll try. Um, okay. I think this is just just such an amazing idea. Um, our whole north end by Washington Park, by the lake, is all WPA structures. They're still standing. We have um, uh, what's called the Rotary Castle or the Engineer's Castle, which is part of the zoo now. We have walls along the beach. We have walls in the parking lots. We have walls every place and they're all WPA. And I think that this is a really good step towards something that will prevent us from getting to where we need to have the WPA to make things work. Uh, I, I really like this idea and I'm really hoping to get more people in Indiana interested in it to support it. And Senator Lovelet, you were just amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm gonna. I'm going to listen to this thing again, and I'm going to tape your responses because that was just so great. It really was. Thank you. And any legislators on the call, reach out to my office. I'll put my LA's number in there. I'm happy to meet with any legislators on the call to talk about how we can get this going on the state level, not for our own bank per se, but just for an advocacy network and, and, and all of that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Really appreciate it. Okay, we're going to go to Q&A. Um, so if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. And uh, uh, let's see here. Um, I know that our speakers are expecting some questions. We don't want to give anything too hard to Professor Hockett because apparently he's just coming off of COVID. So, um, but let's see here. Okay, while we're waiting for people to, oh, there we go. I see some questions. Okay, let's go to Dennis Montoya uh, from New Mexico. Thank you. There were some comments in the chat about state uh, public banks. And I would like to hear from one of our experts how state public banks 
could work in conjunction with the National Infrastructure Bank. Ellen, do you want to take that? Uh, sure. Uh, so, a state in, there is such a thing as a state infrastructure bank. I saw that somebody had asked that question. We in California have a, what's called a state infrastructure and development bank, but the problem is it's not really a depository bank. It's just a revolving fund. So it has a certain amount of money. It lends it out. Like I think it had three hundred million dollars last time I looked, or thirty million. I forget. Anyway, it lends it out and uh, waits for it to come back and lends it again. Whereas an, a, a real depository bank as the National Infrastructure Bank would be, can lend 10 times as much as it has capital. So it can lend a lot more. And um, actually that would have been a good question for Bob Hockett, but you know he's explained how the original vision of the central bank was that the, the 12 district bank, or maybe nobody's good at this, I don't know. The 12 district banks, um, would be dealing with the particular districts because a, a central bank in Washington obviously cannot know the needs of all the states. I mean, the country is huge. So we need boots on the ground sort of banks that know the local market and know who the where the good loans are. I, in China, they have a massive um, boots on, or on the ground banking, local banks that work with the with the um, infrastructure banks and work with the central banks. So that's what we would need to do too. So ideally you would have this whole public network that filtered all the way down to the smallest banks. And if it was on the model of say the Bank of North Dakota, the, the local community banks are private. So you could have private banks that would be um, dealing with, I don't know, maybe Alfeca has thought, <laughs> thought that through as well. Oh, I better pass to somebody more knowledgeable about NIB. What do you think? Thank, thanks, Ellen. Um, I do want to say that there uh, really is only one other state bank in existence in the U.S. right now, and that's the State Bank of North Dakota, as I understand it. Although right. there are other kinds of institutions, like for example, in Maine, uh, you all have, um, it's kind of like a bond bank, isn't it? A, a, a state government institution that actually helps all your local areas go out for bonds. So they're, um, they help with keeping the expense of getting uh, that financing for municipal projects. But um, so, and I know in Washington state, there's a very vigorous effort going on to create a state bank in Washington. However, that has not gotten through the legislature yet. So we're going uh, for it this year. <laughs> this upcoming all right, session. All right. And Good I mean, just one. to add to it, you know, there's so many, so much need uh, that I, I think that as many ways as we can complement that work uh, is going to be useful. So, you know, if, if there is the establishment of a national infrastructure bank, then that would allow our state infrastructure bank to pivot to more housing needs or to paying, setting up funds in Department of Commerce, as an example, to be able to fund things like hydrogen electric chassis for long haul truckers. Uh, as just, you know, these are places that are really hard to decarbonize. They're usually just small guys in small shops uh, that really need that help to meet that cost differential. And I think that's where if there's the establishment of both, we have the opportunity to have complementary funding streams that are going to get at both, you know, public and private sector. Um, thank, thank you, Senator Lovelett. Um, okay, uh, I would like to ask a question here um, and pose it to our economists. And that is, um, I want to say that, uh, you know, I've been in kind of one of those conservative types of businesses where you actually have to sell a, a good or a service and make a profit, or you don't stay in business very long. And so to me, it's really been astonishing to see the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that have poured into uh, certain sectors of the economy on uh, for with companies with, where they never actually produce a product that makes a profit. And I'm talking about things like uh, you, you know, the next cool app for your cell phone and that sort of thing, phantom software products that never get produced. And what I want to know is, are we over investing in that segment of the economy? Is, is money flowing over there that should really be flowing into uh, roads and bridges? Um, Dr. Prince, what do you think about that? You're, You're muted. muted. It's funny because I was just talking about technology. Um, while I was muted. Now, we, we obviously do see, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of money going into those sorts of areas where your, your multiples, your, your price to earnings ratios are very, very high, your, your stock price is very high relative to what they earn, relative to, um, to what they invest in something that's sort of more broad economically based. That said, 
there are technologies that could probably be used for energy efficiencies and infrastructure development um, and to make to make those endeavors more efficient. So, um, you know, that, that happens on both sides. I, but I do want to also link that into where sort of Wall Street is on this, because that's where that's why a lot of money has been directed um, at certain sectors that don't necessarily help. Uh, build infrastructure or build clean energy policies and grids and networks and upgrades because um, it just gets directed elsewhere. And that goes back to the fact that it was there in abundance because of central bank policy and this monetary inflation. So I, I do think that what's happening is that Wall Street, not that you know this is a necessity for investment, but they do have money, is starting to direct certain funds into some of the energy sector. And I think the reason that's happening, because at the end of the day, they want to make money. And at the end of the day, politicians want to stay in office, um, or at least the ones on the Fed. Oh, I mean, it, we're, we're talking about local level, so I'm, not, I'm being broad based here. But, but the idea is to connect the local level needs with the federal level funds and have it basically come all the way down. And when we created, and you know, Fecky, you, you, you sort of Professor Hodges worked there, but the, the World Bank was sort of based on not this model, but the idea of lending in order to develop and having, you know, a cost, a price to pay for that lending that came out of, you know, the backs of real people around the world and particularly more impoverished nations. This is a situation, the NIB, where the idea is that you're actually you're creating something very similar, something we created, something that's housed in Washington. It's not really that weird to have a national infrastructure bank that issues bonds that are sold potentially by Wall Street as a way to buy in the entire financial community if that's necessary in order to get more people on board in terms of pushing the NIB. The reality is Funds are going to come where money goes and, and, and investment's going to come where it can be replicated once we set something like this up, where you can at least know that you're completing projects from the local level to the state level to the federal level. Um, and so I, I do think that there is more. I mean, we've seen that in the last couple of days since the um, basically since the IRA was passed by the Senate. The Inflation Reduction Act with $369 billion going towards basically clean energy endeavors if it, if it passes. And yes, some are tax incentives, some are investments. But the point being that that created a, a, a little mini stock bubble for a second in those companies that will be related to these endeavors. So so I do, yeah, I, I, I and, and people work for those companies, right? So I, I think we, we can look at the broader sort of local and national corporate structure as well in a positive way in this particular sense, where those, the people and the companies and the money are used to amplify um, and to augment what the NIB is doing to amplify the debt that we already have extended that isn't going into these projects. And to back uh, and also to amplify some of these acts to get passed with federal money and to connect that all together. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, next, I would like to uh, go to Timothy Bruni. You've got your hand up. Do you have a question for our panelists or a comment? Tim? Yes. Have Do you, you have tried shopping? Have you tried shopping the NIV idea to Larry Summers and said Chair Jerome Powell? If so, how did they respond? If not, why not? And how do you know that they would be utterly opposed? Okay, let's go to uh, maybe our uh, NIB coordinators or our FECA. Uh, Alfeca, have you called up Larry Summers recently? <laughs> You're muted. Uh, no, not really. We do have a lot of folks on our, um, I run an, a, a monthly newsletter, which some of you might have gotten, uh, and we do send it out to as many economists, uh, members of Congress, um, think tanks um, as we possibly can. And we're really trying to make inroads into elevating this through getting more co-sponsorships to raise it up as a possible policy choice by the congressional leadership. Um, we think that, um, they, that they've gone about their business of trying, uh, you know, they're passing these bills that they've passed so far. They made a good start, but um, there is no point in running our economy into the ground, making this policy choice to put out people, millions of people out of work when we can have an option like this to lean against a recession 
uh, by uh, create, using infrastructure investments. Um, other countries do this, and it's a, it's a viable policy option. It's worked uh, for us before. China is using it now, as Alan Brown has pointed out, and uh, we need to con really consider this. So uh, that's why we need all of your hands on deck to help us bring the idea forward. And we and is, and we are trying to make inroads into the administration uh, to to bring this to their attention as a viable policy policy choice. Thanks. Hello. Oh, oh. You have another and quick question, Tim? Have you sent any messages to Larry Summers and Jerome Powell requesting meetings to discuss the National Infrastructure Bank. <laughs> yeah, we, we do send out requests all the time for meetings. Um, we've been focusing them for the most part on the, um, the, the parts of the administration like uh, the White House, like the uh, Department of Transportation, Department of In Interior, which would take care of you know, droughts and things like that, um, Department of Agriculture, places where we can complement what's being spent through the budget with activities and projects that are financed by the National Infrastructure Bank. So yes, we are trying to make, to bring our um, policy lifted up as a policy option to be considered. Uh, El fact, if I can just quickly ask you, who do you feel is the most influential economist in the Biden administration right now? Well, I mean, Larry have, Summers is not part of the administration, right? He, right. Hmm? There is a Council of okay. Economic Advisors, um, and we have tried to, uh -huh. many of these people were on the transition team. Many of the economists were on the transition team, and we had early meetings with the transition team and those economists to bring bring this uh, policy to their attention. Um, and we have met with um, the, the second leadership down for the Department of Transportation. We're trying to get meetings with the uh, Commerce Department. Um, so it, it's like that. We're trying to um, promote the bank and as many avenues as we possibly can. Um, and we're, and any, anybody that has any, uh, many, uh, of our legislators know these uh, folks. Uh, for example, the uh, the New Mexico group has good inroads with the current administration uh, secretariats, and uh, so do, so does Rhode Island legislators. So we're we're using those as um, sort of backdoors, and uh, and and uh, also with the with the Biden administration and President Biden himself, um, because he comes from Delaware, and um, you know that's the way we're making our approaches. Okay. I think the short answer is Tim we're, Tim, we're doing everything we can to contact everybody we can, whether we know them or not, to get their attention. And so this is where we really appreciate everybody on this call helping us out and uh, contacting their local representatives or their congressperson and, and helping us create those inroads into the, the power structure there in Washington. But let's go to Richard Arena, who's got his hand up. Richard, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um... Professor Hoffaker talked a bit about comparative advantage, which is obviously a very key economic uh, indicator. This question uh, is not related exactly to that, but it is competitive ad, ad, ad advantage. This. So my my question is: We talk a lot about the Chinese banks versus, say, the American bank, the American banking system, where we're uh, they, we're essentially thirty two trillion in debt uh, for, on the federal federal level. How comfortable are we that our chief competitor, which is China, how comfortable are we that their banking system can continue the growth they're doing with some of the issues that they have? Uh, Alfeca, you've got an answer on that or a comment? Well, it is the case that um, not just China, but Southeast Asia has sort of overextended its investments, especially on the... Um, commercial real estate sides. And uh, China has also been getting into speculation, which the, ch the, the Chinese bank has clamped down on. So there is this aspect of overextending and overinvesting beyond what you really should do. But there's n absolutely no question, uh, it, the, putting that aside and corruption you know, possibilities and those other kinds of things too, putting that aside, there's no, absolutely no question that they have had a miraculous um, growth development. And keep in mind that in 1970s, China was food, in, uh, China was population was food insecure. 
They had problems with starvation in their population. Coming out of that, they've used this Alexander Hamilton banking methodology and um, um, development strategy to, to develop their economy. They have grown astronomically, not just that they, uh, they, they took over all of the production that the United States used to do, but beyond that, they have used these banks to build 23,000 miles of high-speed rail. Along those high-speed rail lines, they have grown their economy to in, include, increase their economic and geopolitical influence in the area. Um, they have become a powerhouse. They have used their banks to, to build water grids, to bring new water to their population. And they've done it with a good deal of, of planning uh, to build, a, build and develop their economy. So there might be, have been over speculation. There might have been over um, you know, investment. But the, the bottom line is, is they really had a phenomenal growth. And they're, they're constantly taking advantage of this in ways that we are not. And they're just really outpacing us and outcompeting us. Um, so we really have to be uh, to to stay competitive with them, to stay uh, economically competitive and politi politically um, influential around the world. We're going to have to do more on our part to develop our economy, and we're just not doing it. We're at an absolute stall and standstill right now, except for these these few bills that I I've talked about. But we need to do much more, and it's not going to be enough to just beef up our military forces. We need to be an economic powerhouse to the same extent that China is today. I, I agree Thank with you, you. Alfeca, but my question more is in terms of non-performing loans. Ah. There, there appear to be a lot of non-performing loans that could potentially start a house of cards that could bring up many major parts of their economy tumbling down. Yeah, uh, Richard, I, I, I know that you know this better than many people do, uh, and I'll take your word for it. Um, uh, we do see them making progress on their water grid. We do see them making progress on their high-speed rail. Um, one thing that this National Infrastructure Bank will also have to do is to make sure that we don't have any non-performing loans, that we roll out the very best infrastructure, the very technologically most advanced infrastructure, uh, and that we make the best choices on um, the selection of, of uh, what kinds of things we roll out in our improvements to our economy. And we want to put the same kind of safeguards in place that were in place for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, where they built very complicated infrastructure. They had zero non-performing loans, and they rolled out all of the best uh, um, improvements like electrification and dams and uh, you know um, schools and things all across the country. We need to do the same with this National Infrastructure Bank. And so it'll be something for us to work uh, to ensure that we do that too. Thank, thank you for uh, that question, Richard. Um, uh, we have another Richard, uh, Richard Sulla, who has put a very provocative question in the chat. And essentially he's asking about the influence of, of the banking lobbyists on the potential ability of, of a national infrastructure bank to function. Richard, could you pose your question perhaps to Dr. Prinz or Ellen from the Public Banking Institute and tell us how we combat the effect of uh, lobbyists for the, the banking well, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, political contributions that okay. the banks the banks make political contributions, the corporations make political contributions. The banks don't want another competitor. I referred in uh, my question to the first and second banks of the United States that were ill-fated. You know, they didn't get their charters renewed partly because the other banks didn't want to have a big government-sponsored competitor. Uh, it seems to me the corporations in the United States now, or many of them, are doing pretty well with outsourcing. Uh, the infrastructure bank is trying to insource, you might say. So the people who are doing pretty well with outsourcing aren't going to be happy about insourcing. The problem I see is that the banks and the corporations make a lot of contributions to our uh, senators and congressmen. And they do some of their bidding, I would have to say. You remember the bill that just passed uh, the Senate recently? Uh, Senator Sinema, a good Democrat from Arizona, managed to get the carried interest uh, uh, mm -hmm. correction uh, taken out of the bill. And, uh, you know, that was, and it turns out she gets a lot of contributions from hedge fund people and people like that. 
And so I, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of opposition from to the infrastructure bank and, and how will uh, the people who support it overcome that? Okay, thank you, Richard. We're going to go to our, our, um, our, our experts here in a minute. But I do want to let you know that, uh, in my opinion, many of those companies that benefited from outsourcing are now suffering the pain because of the global supply chain crisis. So they may have gotten away with it for 20 years, but they are suffering now because of the excessive outsourcing that's happened. And so um, I am personally happy to see some level of renaissance of manufacturing in the U.S. as companies voluntarily are going back to manufacturing here. But anyway, let's go to uh, Ellen Brown and then Dr. Prince to address this question of uh, lobbyists for the banking industry and campaign contributions. Okay, thanks. Well, I was actually just going to suggest uh, Nomi answering this question. I oh. thought that was really interesting about the... Um, her suggestion about the, the Wall Street banks selling bonds. They could certainly sell the National Infrastructure Bank bonds. And if we could get the pension funds to buy into, the, I, I know the theory right now is that we'll be selling stock or swapping shares for securities, federal securities for capital. But it seems to me that we could also sell bonds, which is what the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did. Anyway, so I'd love to hear Nomi's thoughts on that. And also, if you had a moment to reflect on China, that was also an interesting question about the, you know, the whole collapsing banks. Yeah, I mean, I just on the bond side, it just it, that that is how, um, or that is what happened with the with the IBRD with the World Bank, and that is what happened with the Reconstruction Finance and Corp. So I mean, I I, I, I think that it's just. Uh, it, it's just a way to sort of say, look, we're, this bank is going to, a national infrastructure bank is going to be focused on national infrastructure. It's going to be focused on connecting the dots between local and state and federal infrastructure planning, which is going to not just give jobs, but it's also going to give money to the companies and the organizations that are involved along the way, some of which happen to be clients um, of Wall Street banks. But but that but but that's not really the point of the sale. The point is uh, on that side, because um, to the point about political contributions, um, that's a whole separate other thing. We, we we currently right now, and we can take this on in a different sort of structure, but right now that is our system. The system is that money goes where money thinks it can reproduce. Money goes um, to politicians that will take it and politicians do what, what tells them. And the point is if we can expand the narrative of what the National Infrastructure Bank is actually focusing on, and I think this is like the best time to do that because we have had so many supply chain problems. And because, again, Wall Street and, and, and politicians sort of care about alignments and they care about the money flow between each other. But at the same time, this is a moment where there is investment to be done in developing supply chains here. It's not just something President Biden is saying. It's not just something even that um, people on the Democratic side are saying. Republicans are saying it, too. Most of the states, you know, and I, I visited all of them recently, but the entire Rust Belt. Um, which is seeing a sort of a renaissance in some of the production there and certainly some of the manufacturing companies coming there, some of the transportation, uh, you know, even like even places like Amazon, they're producing or distri distributing outside of um, you know, going through the middle of the country and they're creating um, distribution networks and they're creating places for EVs and they're creating the necessity to upgrade um, electric net electric grids there in order to provide enough electricity, which is pushing forward electricity technology, which is something that Wall Street is investing in. Um, and so there is a, there is a cycle that in a moment, I think we have here to connect all of these dots and all we're seeing is that we want a mechanism that can that can enable um, these projects to actually come to completion, which is better for everyone that it's invested in them from the companies to the investors, even to the speculators and to the workers. And this is just another mechanism to do that. And just to the point about China, um, it's really nice to ride their fast trains. Um, you know, there, 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 there is there is something about getting from Beijing to Shanghai because your flights aren't working because the air is just crap or whatever, um, which has happened. But but the point being that there there, there is certainly a, an abundance of money that's coming through the system of China that's actually strategically going out to um, build transportation infrastructure and build um, real estate and, and so forth in the rural areas. And some of that, yeah, it's not going to all. Um, it's not all going to be utilized to 100% capacity, but what, what does get built in terms of connecting points A to B, 
um, from terms of transportation infrastructure, communication infrastructure, and energy um, technology and new energy for the sole purposes, um, if only, to avoid having to just simply rely on oil from other countries, um, actually is continuing to be funded and is continuing to grow there, even if there are other parts of weaknesses around the economy. It's just something we can learn from. Yeah. I, I just, go ahead. Go ahead, Ellen. I, well, and I agree with Alfeca that it's it's really the, the Chinese have shown what we can do with our own system that we haven't done. And so that's the public part of it. And the it's the private banks, of course, that are that are in trouble, the private real estate developers. Um, but as a model, just to show that this works, you know, we're not just imagining this actually worked in China and it worked in Roosevelt's in, in the 1930s. So we can do it again. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, direct a quick question to Lou Spencer. And I'm wondering, so if we build these projects, are we going to be able to find the workers? Yes, I think so. Um, if we do this properly, we will fund apprenticeship programs. The apprenticeship pro programs will recruit young people. Right now, I think um, the big problem is people coming into the trades don't think that it's a sustainable career. And it absolutely is. Um, the apprenticeship programs will train the workers to become journey persons. And they also provide continuing education opportunities. Uh, these people will earn good pensions. They will earn medical uh, benefits and they will earn decent wages. So uh, I absolutely think that we will find the people to do the work if we have the financing in place to, uh, you know, st start these projects. Build it and they will come. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, with that, I think we're going to move on. We're uh, getting to the end of our program here. And so we do have some uh, slides we would like to close with. And um, if you have enjoyed the expertise of our speakers, um, Mark, are, are we putting up slides? Um, I'd like to let everyone know that um, Dr. Prince has a, a book, um, I believe it's on Amazon, pre-order on Amazon, is that right? Called Permanent Distortion, How Financial Markets Abandon the Real Economy Forever. That sounds really interesting. Is, is it available now or? Uh, so it is, already? it's. It is, and it also is for is through the local bookstore network. Oh, okay. um, so you can, get, which basically you can go into um, that link will take you. Well, there is a link somewhere, but it'll take you to the local bookstore in in your area. Um, so, well, I mean, Amazon obviously people order books there as well, but also there, um, it's it's sold through the local bookstore network too. Wonderful, appreciate it. So that would be Dr. Nomi Prins, and her the name of her book is Permanent Distortion. So that sounds very interesting. And uh, then I would like to uh, note that Ellen Brown recently had an article published in Shearpost and uh, uh, entitled Interest Rate Hikes Will Not Save Us from Inflation. <laughs> right, Ellen? Great. So um, I'm sure people can find that online. And that is a recent article that came out on July 27th. So uh, again, thank you for being on our program. Um, and then I would like to uh, mention that Dr. Hockett um, has an article in The Nation. This is the July 13th uh, issue of The Nation. Uh, and this article is called, This Doesn't Have to Hurt, an Argument Against BDSM Economics. So that sounds really interesting also. So I would really encourage everybody to uh, maybe check out these authors online and um, you know learn a little bit more about uh, their work. Um, next, I'd like to move on to, um, we have, oh, we also have an article in the uh, Cascadia Advocate, uh, which is a publication of the Northwest Progressive Institute. And uh, so this is an uh, article in the uh, July 27th issue uh, talking about there's a better way to fight inflation, save jobs and curb a recession, and that's create a Hamiltonian National Infrastructure Bank. So, and I believe that was Alfeca's article, is that right? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so really appreciate the fact that our experts are getting out there and being published and um, in a variety of ways around the country. And this is what we need to continue to do to reach out to um, our fellow citizens and raise awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, I think I had mentioned earlier that we have a podcast um, that is out there. And this is um, called the National Infrastructure Bank would rebuild the US, create jobs and restore global competitiveness. 
And so that is a podcast hosted by Representative Pam Powers Hanley and features Alfeca, Ellen Brown from the Public Banking Institute, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Robert Hockett. So um, please look for our podcast, and I believe we have the link to that on our website. Um, and then uh, finally, there's an article in the Nation magazine called Schumer's Inflation Reduction Act Includes a Smart Tax on Corporations. So, um, oh, and we have an ad. I don't know, you guys probably can't see this, but this, uh, this, this blue blurb at the top, this is an ad that the National Inf Infrastructure Bank um, paid for. And we have been doing advertising in publications around the country. We hope to do uh, more and, you know, certainly in your neck of the woods. So um, if you would like us to help advertise in your area, let us know. And of course, uh, we could use your help with uh, donations to help fund our advertising uh, efforts. And so if you'd like to help support us, please go to our website, which is uh, www.nibcoalition.com. We also have a Facebook page and um, you can give us a call on the phone, 866-739-1791. So we are here to help you in your efforts to reach out in your community. And then of course, finally, you know, we're always asking people to call your member of Congress because ultimately we want Congress to create this National Infrastructure Bank, 202-224-3121. So um, anyway, uh, that is our program for this evening. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Really appreciate it. Very huge thanks to our panel of experts. You all did a great job uh, tonight and uh, appreciate all the insights. Thank you. So thanks, everyone. And you know, keep in touch. And we'll do it again.